So in 1912, capital flows among the world were freer than they were at any time until 1996. The only countries in the world that demanded passports were Ottoman Turkey and Tsarist Russia. Yeah. And yet, yeah. four well, years later. Yeah. Yes. Well, these are long-term slow trends uh, in the spread of liberal democracy and market capitalism with lots. I, I see it as, you know, it's just like the global warming, you know, two steps up, one step down, and so on. And, and I think that there's all those other variables that play, my list of things that have to be in place, uh, which is how to turn a third world nation into a first world nation. Uh, no one of them is going to operate. And so, um, well, Thomas Friedman calls this his McDonald's theory or the Dell computer theory of this. There are exceptions, of course, but it, it's a first approximation of how we get from here to there by shifting it gradually that, in that direction. I don't think anything I said about liberal democracy is at all surprising. Uh, I would recommend uh, Nate, Nate and uh, Sharansky's book, The Case for Democracy, uh, for, for those kinds of exceptions, although I'm not a, I don't know that much about political history. But economics, that's, I'm trying to focus on the market capitalism. Rana? Yeah, I have a comment and question pertaining to Dr. Haidt's talk. Uh, I think that most people would now agree that um, your emotions can profoundly influence your reasoning, can in fact sway your reasoning in the wrong direction. A powerful example of this is um, superstitious belief, religious beliefs, which you, know, you can try to correct with reasoning, but in fact they're very tenacious and fail to be corrected. But I'm concerned that you don't swing to the other extreme because there are many instances where the opposite is true, uh, where reasoning can profoundly influence emotions. And I can think of at least two examples. One is what's called cognitive therapy, which many people here may have heard of. And the central premise here is that many emotional disturbances, such as very severe depression, can in fact be, you regard them as emotional disturbances, but in fact, Often they're based on a single or a handful of flawed intellectual assumptions and flaws in reasoning. And you can institute psychotherapy to pluck that uh, false assumption, alter the reasoning, and in fact, this eliminates the depression. And this has been uh, repeated with controlled double-blind trials and is at least as successful as Prozac. So this is an example of intellectual correction of emotional disturbance. Another example which is more obvious is the, is the fact that humans also are capable of abstract reasoning, which is immune from emotions. In fact, that's why you call it abstract reasoning. So I can do problems in number theory, uh, discover laws of prime numbers, and this is not influenced by my emotions in any respect. So I think the thing to realize is, as with most brain processes, these are qu quasi-independent emotions and reasoning, different styles of computation, but they influence each other profoundly, and it's important not to assert that one is influencing the other or the other way around. Right. Um, I do quite agree that it's a two-way street. I think cognitive therapy is indeed the most effective therapy out there for many disorders, and it's usually as good as Prozac. But even though it's a two-way street, there are six lanes one way, and there's a, a small path coming back the other. Uh, the emotions influence the reasoning profoundly and powerfully in seconds. The cognitive therapy takes weeks to work, and you have to really work at it. And if you tell people to do it, most of them will fail because it's hard work. So yes, it's a two-way street, but it's not, they're not at all equivalent. Um, secondly, I don't agree that abstract reasoning is immune to emotion. All of us in this room engage in abstract reasoning, and my claim is that our moral commitments guide our abstract reasoning. Um, their uh, research on everyday reasoning done by Deanna Kuhn, I think it was, gave people various problems like should we raise the minimum wage? And people come up with, an, people have a gut feeling like yes, and then they look for reasons. Um, mm -hmm. um, the one group that was found to not do that was philosophy graduate students. They actually looked on both sides. <laughs> They're freaks. No, of course, obviously, <laughs> I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's a good thing. And if we could teach people to reason well and it led to them reasoning well, I would be all for it. Efforts to improve reasoning have failed miserably. You can teach people statistical reasoning with semesters of statistics, so it's not impossible. But efforts to teach re people reason well just don't, have not yet shown promise. I believe that the trick to good reasoning is to recognize what we're good at and what we're bad at. What we're good at is responding to others around us. What we're really bad at is understanding our own motives that we really can't see. So I think the way to improve reasoning is to embed people into groups in which the other people correct them. And my central claim is that we are not in such a group when it comes to morality because we have no diversity. Pat? Um, yeah, I greatly enjoyed uh, David Sloan Wilson's discussion, but I have to say I was a little disappointed 
that you didn't have time to respond to some of the issues that Dan Dennett brought up. And in particular, um, I was struck in Dan's conversation about the, what he called the engine of hypocrisy and the idea that practical reality is maybe something that we ought to prefer over practical fa or over factual reality because of its greater uh, functionality for survival or whatever it was. And, and it does seem to me that there are probably really quite serious social issues there. So I wonder if, <coughs> now that, <coughs> excuse me, you have a bit of time, if you might be able to respond to that part of Dan's talk. Uh, sure, and I think I do want to uh, distinguish uh, between descriptive claims and normative claims. It is not my claim that, uh, that we should adapt, adopt practical realism over factual um, realism. It's my descriptive claim that if we un want to understand the nature of human mentality, and I hear I'm much along the lines of what uh, John's saying and what other people have said earlier this morning, is this, you know, the way the mind works. And in a sense, what it's adapted to do is to derive uh, uh, belief systems that are high in, in uh, uh, practical realism and that factual realism is the servant of practical realism showing up when useful and quietly excusing itself otherwise. And I think that that's much along the lines of what John was saying. I'd also like to take note that um, uh, the great example that Dan gave of that horrible Machiavellian person, right, who was it that was uh, saying about how uh, we just study their invention of reality? Some aid of um, President Bush's. Yeah, well, you know, that was not a religious person, or at least you couldn't tell that from the religious quote. So uh, that's why we want to dissociate this, this issue of practical versus factual realism from the issue of religion. So then that's one of the points that I, um, I was trying to make. So by all means, you know, my own personal ideal belief system is uh, uh, maxes out on factual uh, realism, good facts interpreted by a good value system. Two final points. One is, uh, if it turned out, as, as uh, we had some speculations earlier this morning, that actually never will work well. And that it will always be, the, if we could decide, I've not made this decision myself, but if we could decide that actually a uh, purely factual belief system could never lead to human thriving, as well as one which had in fact distorted practical reality, then we'd all be in a dilemma, not just me. Dan himself would decide, I think, under a circumstance like that, that uh, we might need to put in an ounce of, of practical realism. And then finally, the point I want to make is that, again, along the lines of, the, of, the, of uh, these, uh, what I sometimes call the ecological and evolutionary paradigm of thinking of cultural diversity as like biological diversity, as like a um, uh, multi-species community. What that means is that liberalism and belief systems in which we can maximize factual uh, realism as much as possible will only thrive in certain environments. And those environments tend to be the safe, secure environments that are found in Western Europe. There's a wonderful book by uh, Pippa Norris and Ronald Inglehart called Sacred and Secular in which they talk about existential security as the environment, basically, high existential security is the environment of liberalism. And so that's why liberalism is alive and well in Western Europe, but worldwide it's shrinking compared to fundamentalism. And so the ultimate prescription, I think, is that if we want to grow liberalism, then we need to increase existential security. And I think that that's a very important practical recommendation. Dan, do you want to respond to that? No, uh, uh, you, I certainly don't uh, disagree with your last point. I think, I think that's, that's right. Um, I think that um, we tend to put the cart before the horse and think that we should introduce some of the, uh, some of the features of our Western uh, Republican freedoms uh, right from the get-go and that that's going to be a, a cure-all and we can see very well that it's not. And perhaps we should, we should tolerate uh, and even support for a while uh, features of other societies that we really don't approve of um, uh, because nevertheless this is the way to prevent a failed state. This is the way to keep 
to keep the uh, 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 to keep things working. I think I've been thinking a lot about the just visceral white knuckle reactions that there have been in the last couple of years to, to the new atheism, and I have a a hunch, it's maybe wrong, but I think a lot of it is due to the following uh, line of reasoning, chain of reasoning. Um, imagine that you are a person of some authority in a country which is on the precipice of becoming a failed state. And people are saying, well, is it safe to plant crops? Is it safe to open my shop? Is it safe to go out the door? And the answer is probably not. But if you're in a position of some authority or some credibility, there's a tremendous and reasonable motivation to lie and say, yo, yo, go ahead. It is safe because that may, if you say no, it may be a self-fulfilling prophecy and we may be into a failed state and that's just a black hole. It's very, very hard to get out of. And I think that a lot of people uh, uh, in, the, in the religious world they look at today's world and they think they're on the precipice of a sort of failed moral state. They think we're right on the edge of collapsing into chaos. And under those circumstances, they are strongly and reasonably, given what they believe, motivated to tell white lies, to lie through their teeth to prevent certain views which they think are, the, are, are going to precipitate a, a descent into chaos from from uh, from getting a hearing. Uh, now, if that's right, what do we do about it? Firmly, calmly, just keep pointing out that these are not true. That these people are are out of desperation, sort of misrepresenting. I mean, the misrepresentations of the four books. Uh, that are out there are just stunning, just stunning. Um, but Dan, there's nothing new in that. I, I think it's no, very no, no. It's, it's a it's a very fun, common phenomenon. Yeah. yeah, I think it's very simple. It, it's nothing to do with that. It's just tribalism. Uh, you know, we we just got tired of being pushed around in such an overtly evangelical culture, so we push back. That naturally causes the other tribe to push back again. That's just normal human primate behavior. I don't think it's anything. No, I think I, I, I that. Michael, I, I don't think I don't think that does justice to the phenomenon at all. But go ahead, I'll let somebody else read. David. Yeah, I think that you know these are interesting points, but I want to reassert my point that it's very important to get the science right. And when you when you study religion from an evolutionary perspective, in fact, when you study any subject from an evolutionary perspective, there's a number of major hypotheses. And one of the fascinating things is that these ideas, which, uh, which a biologist would use to study spots on a guppy, these major hypotheses, also serve as well for the study of religion. Now, what are some of these? In a very brief amount of time, where there is, for example, the parasitic meme hypothesis, in which culture is like a disease. Well, if that's true, then we want to exercise those memes. They're like modern demons, and we want to, to get rid of them. Well, then there's uh, uh, the byproduct hypothesis, and there's a variety of all of these, but uh, uh, Dawkins has a wonderful metaphor of moth to, uh, moth to flame. So, you know, moths have, are adapted to navigate by celestial bodies, light bodies. That's good. That's the adaptation. Unfortunately, that causes them to spiral towards um, earthly uh, light sources. And so maybe religion is a moth to flame. If that's true, that leads to another set of prescriptions. Or maybe religion is a group level adaptation. Each one, one of these is going to call for a different prescription just in order to do something effective. And so unless you get the science right, you're simply not going to diagnose the problem and you're not going to have an effective prescription. So on top of everything that Dan has said, I want to add this other stuff, is that if this isn't being fueled by high quality science, then we're in trouble and just we want to be vigilant about that. And then that, once again, is, is my own principal complaint against um, the new atheists, is that if you read the books, it's not a distortion of those books in order to, to conclude, or to have the authors conclude, that far and away, the parasite hypothesis, the moth to flame hypothesis, these are the, these are the uh, this is our scientific understanding of religion, and it's not. Look, but, but David, we we've, one point. Um, I've, I've begged you to clarify this point in the past, and you have, but now you've gone back on it. 
in my discussions of the parasite hypothesis, I've been very clear about the fact that symbionts come in all varieties. They, there are mutualist symbionts, there are parasitic symbionts, and that the, the, the claim that religions are cultural symbionts is not the claim that they're awful, awful viruses. For that matter, 99 out of 100 viruses aren't awful. So get off the demon virus hypothesis. You want, you're complaining about uh, uh, bad science. Well, you're misrepresenting me and you're misrepresenting Dawkins. That's not good science either. Dan, do you mean to say that you think most believers know that it's baloney and they believe in belief? Know that what's baloney? Well, I mean, you start off, with, you, we're talking about lies or little white lies. Yeah. Uh, are you, uh, I mean, I'm just trying to uh, understand what you're saying, that most believers actually know that it's not really true, but they go along with it anyway? Because my experience in the research looks to me like most believers, they really do believe the resurrection, the, you know, the, all, all that stuff. Well, I think most believers don't know what they believe, and in fact, their religions encourage them to to be comfortable in the fact that they don't know what they believe because that's, that's the tradition. It's a mystery. We're not, we're not supposed to be able to know what we believe. That's, uh, uh, that's what makes it so easy for them to declare with, a, with an open heart that they believe this stuff because they are not only excused from understanding what they claim to believe, they're basically forbidden to understand but what they claim to believe. But you use the word lie like yeah. they're knowingly lying. Michael. Yeah. So okay. I'm sorry, <laughs> well, there's, a, there's a line of people. Peg Jacobs got a microphone, I think. There seems to me to, you, yeah. seems to, me to be <laughs> two alternative visions of the future that Michael's putting forward and Jonathan is putting forward, and they're not really ultimately compatible. You, you're pro, pro, proposing that a sort of cosmopolitan, uh, wiki informed culture will make the world into an EU and this will pr promote liberal democracy on a scale unimaginable. But what you're saying right. is that there are all these group in, in, in impulses to in inclusiveness that will ultimately trump this uh, alternative vision that you, you, the people you are describing are ultimately not going to be happy in, in liberal mm -hmm. democracy. That's right. Uh, a, a really important concept that has not been mentioned here except tangentially is individual differences. Um, I think Ted had some finding on individual differences in how people play games and we do know that religiosity, uh, authoritarianism, conservatism, liberalism, we know that these traits are highly, uh, to some extent, heritable. And what we have to realize, I think, is that like any personality trait, um, liberalism, the, the, the desire or ability to live in the kind of, 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 of liberal or libertarian paradise that Michael was talking about, um, this is a personality trait distributed on a bell curve. Um, you can describe that bell curve largely with the single trait of openness to experience. That is the personality variable that is the highest correlate of politics. People are high on openness to experience, uh, are those who like variety, diversity, change, excitement, those sorts of things. So if once we recognize this and realize that all of us come from the, the, the extreme quarter of the distribution and openness to experience, or, or roughly, um, then I think what we can be drawn to is a world that says, you know what? We are not all the same. Some of us, you know, some of us really want to live in New York and San Francisco, and some of us really don't. And wouldn't it be great if we had a country in which, in some parts, people could have their strong churches and their strong family groups and, and could live the way that they find congenial, and as long as they let the people in New York and San Francisco live the way that they find congenial? So I think we have to not be so self-righteous here. We have to uh, uh, you know, um, acknowledge our own values of diversity and say that that's exactly right. Some people can't live in Michael's world, and we but need to have a world that will allow both. The logic of the position you're taking to say to those people who must live. Well, while, they're, while they're getting the mic, let me just say, would you take that as far as some people want to live in North Korea while others are more suited for South no, Korea? No, no, no. North Korea is okay. an abomination. No, no. No, but what no, you're but it, what, the, the, logic, the, the logic of your position, as I understand it, Jonathan, is that those people who want to live in New York and San Francisco are entitled to do so. But the homosexuals who are living in Kansas must now move to New York and San Francisco. I think that's a deeply illiberal position. Oh, no, and no, let no, me no. just add here that Putnam's work on diversity, this recent work, has been heavily criticized um, by people in my own sociology I'm, department. I'm sure it has. So uh, to take Putnam's uh, as an authority here on the, the anomie that comes from diversity, I think you're forgetting there's a huge sociological opinion out there that deeply disagrees. 
Well, I'm, I'm sure it is. If you gore a sacred cow, people are going to disagree. Now, that isn't to say that the criticisms aren't valid, but... So, so one of the other problems here as well, is, which I was making the point this morning, the, the Neurath quote about the, the boat and the planks and not being in the same boat. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I'd hoped we could get out of this meeting, actually, is to inject some rigorous science into some of this as, as well, in the sense that you'd think we'd have moved forward from kind of sort of what Mo, some, Hobbes said some of the time and versus what some of Rousseau said some of the time. But it, it, it doesn't seem that. I mean, to a general public sitting out there thinking to themselves, I thought we had this Darwinian thing down. Now we've got these people arguing again about whether sociobiology was wrong, whether it's group selection, whether it's kin selection. It's deeply but th confusing. But those are, those are details. I mean, none of us here doubt yeah. that, that, that Darwinian natural selection explains just about Right. all of the things we're talking about. But, but, but the, the, the positions that you have, the, the two positions that you have on here have extensions that go into issues of altruism, issues of w whether groups are nice to each other, whether individuals are mean to each other. I mean, they have massive ramifications. And That's what's so, so exciting about this, that we can all share the same foundational assumptions, but by making a single or one or two changes of, of additional assumptions, you can get radically different outcomes. Right, but I think that some of that may be lost some of the time because these details are uh, argued in the journals and so But Sam, you, you have a microphone? Yeah, I just wanted to respond briefly to David Sloan Wilson's charge of bad science. Um, you seem to think that I have argued that religion is uniformly bad, that its influence on the world is uniformly negative, that it has, could have served no evolutionary purpose. I've never even been tempted to make such an argument. And I don't know what you thought you were getting at with, the, with referencing my, my discussion of Jainism from last year, but my only mention of the Jains was not that Jainism, too, des destroys people's lives. I, would, I never argued that, and I'm well aware that Jains are some of the most productive and, and wealthy uh, communities in, in India. Um, the point is there is a difference, a behavioral, logical difference between believing that that blowing yourself up in a crowd of innocents can get you into paradise and believing what the Jains happen to believe, which is that non-harming is the core of your, uh, your uh, eschatology, ultimately. Um, so th that's it, that, that beliefs have consequences and different beliefs tend to have different consequences. Uh, and the, 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 point of, the point of the new atheism, and this again is a t term I hate and, and have done my best to to get off my shoulders, but the, the point is not that science has proven that the, the effects of religion are uniformly bad or even mostly bad uh, in every context. The point is there is, a, there is a difference between knowing something and pretending to know something. Uh, and there's a difference between a sphere of discourse that encourages rigorous self-honesty uh, and, and peer, peer criticism uh, that purifies deceit and self-deceit, and a kind of discourse that doesn't do that, in fact, does the, the antithesis of that, in fact, makes it a sacred principle to immunize people from criticism. And people like yourself um, are collaborating in that immunity by saying we can't criticize religion, we should be slow to criticize religion, we should criticize dogmatism wherever we find it, in the scientific here, here. community, in politics, in our personal lives, and, and it just so happens that scientists are, are the most likely of, of any wing of, of discourse to practice this. We don't do it perfectly, and the first people to point out that we don't do it perfectly are scientists. And, and, and the cure for, for bad science is good science, not religion. And, and you know, it's embarrassing to even have to feel like I have to say this in this context, but uh, Apparently, I do. It's, 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 and again, I mean, this is just the, the issue is not that there are never scientific errors and there are not live scientific debates. Uh, but, but we are people who talk honestly about these controversies. And there's a very different style of discourse going on in much of the world. And people are prisoners of that discourse. Uh, they, you know, North Korea is an abomination. Well, maybe some North Koreans don't know that. Uh, wearing a burqa is an abomination, quite frankly. And it doesn't matter how many people in a burqa will stand up and say, no, it's not. I th we are in a position to appreciate that they have not been given true freedom of choice. And we should speak honestly about that. And you take someone like Ayan Hirsi Ali, who in her own person 
is an existence proof of the full transformation of, of just really finding the enlightenment in one lifetime, going from, from being a fundamentalist Muslim who was chanting the death of Salman Rushdie and now being the most uh, re re hunted critic of Islam on the planet. Uh, she in herself can tell you what psychological mechanisms uh, she was aware of and what, and what cultural mechanisms she was aware of in allowing this transformation. Um, and we, we, should pay wit we should bear witness to that kind of possibility. Um, do you want to respond to that? David Brennan, you have a comment as well. Well, yeah. Uh, first off, Michael, <laughs> you might be interested in the effect of rivers historically because rivers um, during times of peace. Um, rivers? Rivers. Yeah, okay. uh, if you look at the ethno eth ethnology of rivers, the everyone was along the river was linked on both sides, on both banks and peaceful purposes by trade and family, whereas when it came to war, rivers were dividing lines that demarcated the lines between nations. Yeah. But what I really want to get to is what I think is a, it has been bugging me the most here is, is a leap to uh, category errors. Um, I, I, for instance, I, I give a lot of public speeches and I often ask, uh, do you think that the American people, do you think people are subjected to propaganda? Everybody raises their hands. They always assume that someone, and when I ask them to name propaganda, they always name something that they disagree with. People will mm -hmm. never name any beliefs that they own as being um, the result of propaganda. Uh, I have uh, seen myself developed into the most reflexive contrarian uh, that I know because I like that image of myself. And as a result, I'm fuming mad at you guys, uh, even though I agree with almost everything I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> and I've considered myself uh, among, among peers and among, uh, among uh, fellow passionate Enlightenment 2.0 guys. I'm fuming at each of you, and I'm, and I'm <laughs> amused by that, seeing that in myself. And there's just so many things I'd like to get to. But the point is, if I were to ask you what propaganda people subjected to, you'd all, you'd all point to religion. When in fact, if you look at po modern films, mo mo modern movies, modern television, the most common message in almost every film is suspicion of authority, usually accompanied by its, its Sancho Panza sidekick of tolerance. And you will find, and, and the main difference between a right-wing piece of propaganda and a left-wing piece of propaganda is who is the nefarious conspiratorial um, um, uh, authority figure trying to bully his way around and create 1984, which is an example of what I, uh, we science fiction authors call the self-preventing prophecy, a prophecy so vivid that it caused itself not to happen by, uh, by making people so scared through its propaganda that they prevent it. Let me give you just a quick example. You know, I, I hate to be the guy who stands up for religion here, but you guys just are not covering all the different categories. To say a world with gods would be measurably different than what we see is to assume, is to front load all versions of religion as being incompatible with observation when in fact what you've done, uh, what you can do, is cut away as Galileo cuts away bad models. We can p cut away bad gods. But there are versions of, rea uh, of religion that are compatible with what we see. For example, the simulation god the god of, of, of our mm -hmm. present uh, situation being a computer simulation. Um, there's no intervention involved there or only subtle tweaks. By categorically uh, ma making a categorical statement, you're, um, you're excluding whole realms of possible ways in which the, the ex possible existence of a bridge to, these, uh, to the religious state Wait, let me just say, I, I, was just agreeing, I was just agreeing with Richard Dawkins that the NOMA, the non-overlapping magisteria, that that business is, is, is nonsensical and that he's right to reject it. That's all. I wasn't... Well, that particular uh, statement struck me because I took it as a dare. You know, of course <laughs> you can come up with gods who are compatible with the present reality. And, and, and here's one thing that came out of uh, Michael Sherman's... Uh, uh, you remember the, 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 one, the article I wrote about parapsychology? Yep. One of the principal traits of the Enlightenment versus the anti-Enlightenment is the time flow of wisdom that is perceived by the Romantic worldview versus the Enlightenment worldview. And th this is psychologically independent to many of the things we've heard today. In an Enlightenment, in a non-Enlightenment culture, in a Romantic culture, whatever golden age there was, was in the past. 
when people were, were better, when they flew through the sky, when they had the powers of gods or spoke to God, and they fell because of some error, some, some tragic uh, fall from a state of grace. Ours is the first civilization that puts its utopia, its potential golden age, into the future where we might hand build it by our own efforts. This is one of the principal psychological differences between the Enlightenment and, its, and, and the, uh, the other cultures. The point is that if you look at parapsychology, for example, no, it did not exist in the past. No, it does not exist in the past. Show me. Great, Randy. Great. <laughs> but it is everything that we want. And your sensors in your walls will detect within 50 years that you want the salt, and your salt will move toward your hand. We want to be gods. And many of the powers that we are attribute to gods are things that we want. And if you get rid of the category error of assuming God being present right now, of all people, Frank Tipler did this. He got rid of the category error of assuming that God had to exist in the past or exist now. But what about us 100 years from now, the whole singularity thing? No. So I, I didn't mean to get into a rant here, but, but you guys, you guys, you guys have been challenging the contrarian simply by setting up quasi-religious boundaries that have got me fuming, and that's non-enlightenment. Okay. Um, who, is, who else had a mic? PZ Myers had a mic? Yeah. Uh, I'll pass it over to David Albert when you're through, and then we'll okay. have to m roll on. But. Okay, I, I, had a, I had a question about Jonathan's ideas there. He mentioned uh, Lattice World and Atom World, and what I heard when you were talking about this is that you're portraying this liberal, secular view as, as a yeah, I didn't do that. Well, anyway, you're portraying as an absence of connections. Didn't like to comment. Yet at the same time, when you sampled this room, you found this remarkable uniformity of opinion. So doesn't that suggest that maybe there are linkages that you just weren't measuring? And I would also suggest that maybe one possible one was illustrated in David's talk uh, when he expressed that outrage over the poor scholarship that what we've got here is kind of a, a, a value in this room for the sanctity of scholarship, the purity of the data, et cetera. And we feel this deep revulsion when people violate that. And that's, that's something that's tying all of us together. And I think it's a pretty important value. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a nice point. I mean, an unfortunate implication of my choosing the term atom world is it suggests that we are atoms floating in the void that don't connect. I did not mean to imply that. Um, when I designed that animation, I deliberately had a couple of them come and touch each other. Um, Liberals certainly have friends, liberals certainly have lovers, liberals certainly connect. <laughs> but I think the connections are much less binding, or at least we don't want them to be. Um, we, uh, we think that all connections must be voluntary and we resist external constraints placed upon us. Um, David and I are both Durkheimians. We both think that Durkheim basically got it right in saying that even if people think that they, are, that they want freedom, um, being bound in to some extent is good for you. Now obviously too much is bad and Durkheim talked about other kinds of suicide and North Korea is an abomination because it imposes things on people that are certainly not for their own good. Um, uh, I do think though that when we look at the history of liberal groups, be they communes or political parties, they tend to fractionate, they tend to split up, they don't tend to be very effective in the long run because the kind of relationships that liberals have are those that are entirely self-chosen. I do think that the wisdom of conservatism and the wisdom of religion is of having found ways to bind people in, to make choices that they would not make themselves that end up in the long run being good for them. Not in all cases, but in some cases. I, I completely agree. Okay. Um, David, quickly. Um, um, well, I mean, quickly to David. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, um, this will be a question which will overflow the boundaries of this session, but, but I, I guess this is just a request to be um, more educated by you guys um, on, on a certain issue. There seems to be, and, and I guess this is a question related to this concern about getting the science right. Um, the way people are talking here it sounds as if a scientific breakthrough on an enormous scale has occurred that I haven't been made aware of yet. <laughs> um, um, and I wonder what the arguments for that, for that breakthrough are. There seems to be a conviction here that 
the most illuminating language in which to understand these phenomena of religion and so on that we're talking about is now transparently going to be the language of natural selection in one form or another. Um, I wonder, you know, people talk about treating religion as a natural phenomenon. That seems to be taken to be synonymous in these discussions with treating it a, as a phenomenon that's going to be best illuminated by the language of natural selection. One would have thought that, say, people like Marx were also treating religion as a natural phenomenon. They may have made errors in their analysis that might have been the wrong way to discuss it, but the error certainly was something other than failure to treat it as a natural phenomenon. Also, you know, um, Professor Dennett points out this capacity of the Darwinian idea to eat anything like, like universal acid in his book. That's surely right. That is, we surely don't expect any explanation of any phenomenon like this that's incompatible with natural selection. But that's like saying we don't expect an explanation of it that's incompatible with the Schrodinger equation. Um, but we'd be surprised if the Schrodinger equation was the right place to start. You know, there used to be, there used to be a wonderful philosopher at Columbia University where I work named Sidney Morgenbesser. And Sidney used to tell, among many jokes, uh, the following one, have you heard scientists have recently discovered the natural selection explanation for the fact that what goes up must come down? And the listener would say, really, what is it? He said, well, the stuff that didn't come down isn't here anymore. <laughs> um, this is surely logically right. Yeah. It doesn't seem like a good argument that that, as opposed to, say, Newtonian mechanics, is the best way to understand the claim that what goes up must come down. So there's no proselytizing involved here. I'm really asking a scientific question whether there are arguments for this that, that, that are more compelling than ones that I'm aware of. Right. Mm -hmm. David, go ahead. Right. So I have a number of hard things here. I'll try to take care of it in a, in a minute. But are, you, uh, which, which, are you going to address that one? We, you also need to address Sam as well. I think if you could reply yes, to Sam. Yes, and question. Dan. Yeah, all right. So, but um, <laughs> I, mean, I am. Uh, very much in the middle of, of studying religion from an evolutionary perspective, not just in the, from the capacity of my own research, but also developing this as a scientific field. And we have a website which uh, we'll make available through Roger, which has explicitly tried to do this in an ecumenical way. So this was done by convening a team of evolutionists to interact with a team of religious scholars, purposely chosen to be diverse and to represent all of the issues that in all of the different um, um, perspectives in the field. And so Scott's been invited, Dan's been invited and accepted. This is all, all um, great. And, and part of that website is uh, a beginner's guide, okay, which deals with some of these issues. And one nice thing about the evolutionary framework is that it provides a sort of a categorization scheme. I call it an accounting system, basically. And there's a level at which a theoretical framework must function as a complete accounting system. And then the second thing I must have is a set of meaningful categories within the accounting system so that you're actually doing something meaningful when you assign things to specific categories. And so you can take previous perspectives, such as a Marxist perspective, an economic perspective, the Durkheimian perspective, and these are actually pretty straightforward to categorize in terms of group level functional. You know, Durkheim at the time, his position was not associated with evolution. Something else was called evolution. But in retrospect, you can't talk about group level functionalism without giving an evolutionary story. And Rodney Stark, for example, has an. In retrospect, you can't talk about, can't talk about literature without talking about the Schrodinger equation. Well, yeah, but that's a meaningful. I'm all about holism and reductionism and that there's appropriate levels of explanation. Right. Okay? That's, I don't think, is the issue. Is the issue here. You can take another example as Rodney Stark's very uh, 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 elaborated theory of religion from, a, from an economic perspective. It's clearly rendered as a byproduct theory, so on and so forth, okay? So I am passionate about establishing a field of evolutionary religious studies which functions in this capacity and in which everybody can find their perspective in a way which is non-threatening. So it's actually not excluding perspectives, but it's providing a unifying framework, which is what evolution does all the time. And I'd like to think that if you were to acquaint yourself with this, and especially the beginner's guide, then you would be put at ease a little bit. Now, nobody likes to have their science called bad. And so, um, but of course, there is such a thing as bad science. 
Uh, I think I should do is pick on the one person who isn't here, Richard Dawkins, and, uh, and uh, concentrate my fire on him. But no, I can't do that. Um, I do, and I would uh, look forward, actually, to, to during our spare time this evening to go at this in, um, in more detail. And I would certainly welcome um, you and anyone else with a serious interest in religion to, uh, to take part in this field. But I, I can tell you that having dealing extensively with, with, these, with the people who are studying religion from a serious perspective, it's, it's, a, it's a different, not just a different crowd, but a different enterprise than what we associate with the new atheism. And finally, uh, just to set things straight with Dan, <laughs> um, there's the meme concept, of course, has a number of, of meanings. And the most general uh, definition of memes is just new speak for culture. Uh, use the word culture, take it out, put in the word meme. And so the broad usage of, of that broad usage of memes, cultural evolution, of course applies not just to parasitic memes, meme plexes, the group level, just about all of the different evolutionary hypotheses can be given a meme formulation when meme is used in that general formulation. Then there are more specific usages of the word meme. What does memes really invoke? Well, it invokes a picture of, uh, of culture's atomistic bits, okay? It also invokes the possibility, which is a legitimate theoretical possibility, so that's part of the mix. One of the hypotheses is that cultural bits, culture does function as a parasite, which only perpetuates itself and is not good for individuals and not good for groups, okay? That's one of the hypotheses. So once again, we need to, we have a, a, an accounting system that includes everything, but we haven't made real progress until we start, until we start assigning on a case-by-case -case basis things into the accounting system. And it's when you do that, then we begin to draw conclusions that although it's a theoretical possibility for culture to act like a parasite, there's not a lot of good examples for it. And the category that's being well filled is this idea of culture not as atomistic bits in any sense, but as very complex systems that are somewhat like what Durkheim imagined, not byproducts, not something that are bad for you but connected to something that's good, like a moth to flame, not a parasite which is bad for only good for itself, but complex systems that are, tend to be good for the whole community of believers, as Durkheim said. And it's that sense in which I think when I criticize people like Dan, is like putting it all in the future. We really need to study religion as a natural phenomenon as if there wasn't enough information to make some of these conclusions already. It's all going to be in the future. Or, in the case of, da uh, of Dawkins, is that we really, if you were to read the book, you would end up concluding, yes, of course, group selection is there as a possibility. It gets one paragraph. It gets a nod. But nobody can read it, that book without concluding that primarily religion is a moth to flame or something that's good for itself, but not good for anybody else. But, Those but, are theoretical possibilities. But David, I think it's good to remember that different authors have different intentions of their goals with their books. For example, Hitchens, since he's not here, I'll defend him. His, his, his statement, religion poisons everything, it's, it's not a scientific statement. He's not a scientist. It's not a work of science. He doesn't mean it that way. He's just making a polemical statement because he's an opinion editorialist. So. So what? I mean, you're, that, so you're, you're, you're judging him by a, a different criteria. Uh, excuse that, me, excuse me, but when we listen to this discourse, we heard it today, we heard it last year, there is these, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to be disparaging, pious statements about reason and science. And I'm asking you, if you, these polemic as they are, they are making factual statements. And if they're, and basically what we're saying is, along with Dan, then let's just be clear that it's espionage. And that's often not clear. So I'm here to say that if we're going to be, we need to have our statements about religion based on science and reason. And that's what everyone else is saying too. Mm -hmm. But I think it needs to be enforced. 